Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Okay, you guys enjoying the building series? Yeah. I am. I love to build things. I like working with my hands. And uh, I love vision. I love seeing new things develop and come to pass. You know, I, I live in Granada Hills, and uh, I have a really nice piece of property with some beautiful orange trees on it and stuff, but the house is older, and it's not that big, and it was good for me when I was a single man. But when I got married, uh, you know, now it's me, the wife, and the stepson, and uh, then a little surprise little girl named Hannah comes along, and it's like we are packed like sardines in this little house. We love it. Uh, but we're dreaming now uh, for more, more space. You know, Emmanuel's 17 now. He needs space. He plays guitar. You know, how, how many people know that when you want to sit down, uh, sit down and get quiet with God and he wants to practice with his electric guitar, there can be some conflict there. So we want to create some more space so everybody has a place to go to do whatever it is they want to do without messing with other people's things. So my wife and I were looking into, uh, well, I have issues with my dream. My issue is that my property is situated in such a way that I really don't have any uh, room addition option. And one of the reasons is, is that in going south, I have a fireplace I don't want to dismantle. And uh, if I go east, my property line uh, is very close to that side of the house, so I wouldn't have enough room for a significant addition. I have a beautiful carport that I built that goes to the west that I don't want to take down and rearrange the whole front door entrance way. And the only other way I have left is north, and because it's an older house, I'm off the street, and there's the septic tank there that you're not allowed to, you can't get permits to build another septic tank. So I'm really kind of stuck. So we are talking the other day and said, you know, we got a lot of nice property here. Why don't we build? like a guest house or an outbuilding. So we, we, we watched this show on uh, Amazon, and it was about these students that were uh, design students, architecture students, and they had to design a small space living home that was fully contained that would fit on a trailer. And uh, we watched all the clever ideas that they came up with about you know what you could do and how you would do the bathroom kitchen how you would sleep, loft ideas and stuff. And it was fascinating. It's like, we could do that. We could make something totally self-contained in the backyard. We got the property. So we're thinking, let's run with that, right? You know, you get vision, you get excited. And then all of a sudden you start looking into the details and you realize that you've got issues that you have to deal with. with you know, how large can we build it without having to get a permit? Uh, what about plumbing? Where do we go? Is it going to be issues for the neighbors? I mean, there's lots of things that you think about after you decide let's move forward that you didn't know you were going to confront. And, and such is the way with the inspiration that comes from God for building and expanding the church and then realizing, wow, we've got issues that we need to deal with. Some issues are from the outside with the city. Some issues are the, from the inside, believe it or not, with the people, right? Wherever there's change and transition and growth, there's going to be growing pains that go along with it. And not everybody sometimes really wants to grow with people. It's like, oh, what's wrong with the church that we got? Why can't we just keep it small and intimate? Why can't we just, you know, and you have that. And I get that because the former church that I was with, I got involved with when there was 300 people. And uh, close to the end of my season there, we had 3,000 people. So I saw all of the growing pains and all of the issues that need to be dealt with and the reorganization of leadership structure and things that needed to happen in order to get to the 3,000 dream. So I'm very familiar with how that looks like and the challenges that present themselves as a result of that. But I mean, God is a God of expansion. He said, light be and light was, right? And there was an explosion, and the universe is still expanding from what he declared all that long time ago. I don't want to attach a date to it and get everybody to, to get into apologetics with me, but 
uh, God is always expanding his kingdom. Why? And we're his children, so we should always be thinking expansion. Am I right? Okay, praise God. So I was in a meeting with Pastor Mauricio, and he says to me, Tim, from your perception and your relationship with God, where do you see Elevate Church uh, right now? What's your perception of what's going on? And I said, uh, you know, that's funny that you should ask that because just yesterday I was sitting down with my wife and she said, Ben, where do you see Elevate right now? Where do you see them in this season? And uh, I want to share what I believe the Lord has shared with me, but I want to make sure that you don't misinterpret my context. Uh, I started reading and, and meditating on um, the dry bones of Ezekiel. And uh, uh, let, let, let's read the verse. Uh, Ezekiel 37. Uh, this is part of 37.5. It says, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. Now, let me please, before I get myself into trouble, define the context in which I want to share this scripture or the, this, these passages. <clears throat> I'm not in any way implying that Elevate Church is in that kind of condition. I'm not in any way implying that we're dry or that we're dead. What I am implying is to go from one level to the next level, we need the breath of God. And in order to get the breath of God, we need to assemble properly. Does that make sense? So let me read a little bit about my notes here so that I don't get ahead of myself. So we know from Ezekiel 37 that Ezekiel is caught up in a vision to a valley of dry bones. And he was asked to walk around and look at the bones. And as I was reading that, I thought to myself, boy, that's strikingly similar to... Uh, Nehemiah making an assessment of the stones of the temple that laid in ruin. And he was walking around, and he, it grieved him. He wept when he saw the condition of the temple because he saw it in its former glory. And now we see Ezekiel walking around, looking at what used to be his forefathers, bones lying in a field, all disjointed, uh, destroyed by the enemies of God from within and from without because Israel, judgment came upon Israel for turning towards idolatry and dividing amongst themselves. Israel left Judah. And uh, so he's making an assessment and the Lord says, can these bones live? And he's like, you know, when God asks you a question, you know, he already knows the answer, right? So he said, Lord, you know, you know. And he said, I want you to prophesy to these bones. And when he begins to speak the word of the Lord over the bones, there's a noise and there's a shaking that takes place. And then all of a sudden the bones rattle and they begin to come together. The Bible says every bone to its bone. Not that it would just assemble, but every bone to its bone. Okay. Every person, every individual in the body of Christ has a divine connection, right? And you have to connect to the place where you fit. And a lot of people in the church, sometimes they try to connect, but maybe they're not connecting where they're supposed to be. You know, if you connect a hand and put it on the end of the leg, it's not going to really work very well, right? If you put the foot on the arm, it's not going to work. But everybody has a place in the body, and everybody has to define that place. You know, now, if you're a young believer and you're getting involved and this is all new to you, the Bible says whatever it is your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. You flow to the need, right? Mauricio started sweeping the parking lot at the church after he got saved because he didn't know what else to do, and he did it under his own volition. Nobody told him to do it. He just couldn't believe how good God was, and he needed to express that physically in some form of service. Uh, ironically, when I came to that church, because of my landscape background, I did the same thing. I started trimming the trees 
in the parking lot there because I just wanted to express to God how grateful I was for his goodness towards me because, man, I was going to hell in a handbasket. I hit the wall, he found me, and he turned me around and gave me hope. And I like, I want to be a part of giving other people hope. And right now I haven't earned any credibility, but, man, I can trim trees, <laughs> right? And uh, do you know that the future that God has for you starts with doing the whatevers? So I'm, I'm in there uh, trimming trees and uh, cleaning the parking lots, doing the garden, planting flowers and so forth. And I had a crew of guys. And so I would show up on the job and I would say, okay, let's get these tools going and let's set this ladder up and I want you to do this and you to do that. So I had a guy up in a tree and I was trying to give him direction on what branches to cut and not cut. And I had never met the senior pastor and had any kind of conversation with him. But I think that he was aware of me because who's the kid that's you know cleaning up the parking lot? Oh, that's just some new guy, right? So this is a wisdom key for service now. I didn't even know that I had a destiny or a real future in God, but I could trim a tree, right? And this pastor gets out of his car, he park, pulls into the parking lot, he gets out and he looks, and he sees us all working there. And he goes to walk into his office, and I'm giving direction to my guys, and he stops and he turns around and he looks again. And, and I'm feeling a little uncomfortable because he's checking me out like, what am I doing wrong? But then he goes, dude, what was your name? I said, Tim. He goes, bro, you got leadership potential. He said, I won't talk to you later, right? Now, I didn't do anything to promote myself, but I put myself in a, in a, into a place of humble service. When you're in a place where you're doing whatever it is your hands find to do, God begins the process of refining and moving you to your specific calling. Okay? So nobody ever, ever, ever in my life before that time ever told me I had leadership potential. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? So you're almost kind of in disbelief. But then I thought, you know, I've run a successful business for quite a while. A lot of the guys have stayed connected to me and faithful. I'm tempted to believe that there's something maybe to that statement. I'm going to explore that. So I'm not going to go and do the long story. I just wanted to emphasize that sometimes doing anything that needs to be done becomes the stepstone to the one thing. Paul said, this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind and pressed towards the mark of the high calling of God. It came to a point where he knew exactly what he was called to do, and he flowed in that current. But until you know what that current is, help everybody. Do whatever it is that you can. Get in the game in some way. That's the only way you're going to begin to narrow down the definition of who you are in Christ. Amen? Okay. So Ezekiel looks at the bones, and the emphasis in this passage is they're dry. They're dead. There's no breath. And my conclusion in reading this is it's because they're not joined together. It's because they're not connected bone to bone. And we know in, uh, put up, you have uh, Psalms, what is it, 133.1? One. Behold how good and how pleasant it is. For the brethren to dwell together in unity. Because the Bible says that it is here where God commands the blessing. Right? You know, you've heard the old uh, scripture. I can't remember the tag. But it's if one can put a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand to flight. You know that verse? So anytime we gather together in unity and agreement, it increases the anointing on whatever it is that we're in agreement about. Right? And since we're all in a process of building and growing, uh, the more agreement we have with the vision of uh, pastors Mauricio and Virginia, the more anointing for its accomplishment is going to be given us for its conclusion. Any, everybody agree with that? Okay. So then what becomes the hindrance of the anointing we need to succeed? Contrary opinions. People who speak, well, I don't know if pastor heard from God. 
you know, that kind of stuff actually begins to work against and diminish what God is trying to accomplish. Now, this is not just a principle in the church, but this is a living principle because we see the demonstration of this principle in the building of the Tower of Babel, where people who were wicked, who wanted to create a way to get to the heavens through works instead of through trusting God by faith, uh, are, are made an example of by God. And, and they build a tower because the, it says the people were all of one language, which basically means they all spoke the same thing. They all dreamt the same dream and they spoke the same language. And so God comes down to see what the children of men have built. And he said, behold, what men begin to do. You know, everything that they have imagined, they can do. There's nothing that shall be restrained from them because of their in agreement, right? So even without the Holy Spirit, agreement can be powerful, right? You know, we see a lot of wicked corporations. You know, you look at like child trafficking. I mean, the organization is unheard of, but there's so many people in agreement that this is the best way to make money, that it's working, and it takes the Holy Ghost to disassemble that. So the Holy Spirit rises up, or I should say the Trinity looks at what man is doing and said, oh, no, I'm not going to have this. And so what does he do to stop the building project? He confounds the language. He gets, he, he moves that situation into a place where nobody can agree on anything. Nobody understands each other's language. And therefore, because no more agreement, no more success in that building program. So you can see how this underscores the need for us to all catch and agree with the vision of God and not speak anything contrary to what. Now, if you do have personal issues with maybe the direction of the ministry, and that always comes up from time to time in the hearts of people, that's where you pray, right? You know, after 30 years of ministry and talking to all kinds of people who have all kinds of issues with all kinds of things, it has been my experience that the people that complain the most are the ones that pray the least. You know, prayer should always be the thing that you do when you have an issue or an irritant or a misunderstanding or a lack of understanding. So agreement is powerful. And the Bible says God commands the blessing on unity. When the bones reassembled, he prophesies over the bones. When the bones connected joint to joint and bone to bone and everything was in place, he commands Ezekiel to prophesy again. And he said, now I want you, now that structure is in place, I want you to call to the four winds. And the breath of God came and it animated those bones wrapped skin around those bones and then God breathed into what was dead and it and life came Adam formed or God formed Adam from the dust of the ground and he breathed into Adam the spirit of God and he became a living soul God called for the four winds through Ezekiel's prophecy and the bones rattled and stood up and became a mighty army by the Spirit of God. But what needed to happen for that army to exist? Every bone had to be properly connected to the right bone. Do you know that you have a divine appointment, a divine connection to be connected with certain people? And to be disconnected from those people is to diminish the supply of the Spirit that's in your life. So it demands that you begin to say, Lord, why am I here? What am I called to do? What are my special giftings? There are no left outs in the body of Christ. Everybody has a place. Everybody has a position. And God doesn't reward the pastor for doing what he's doing more than the usher for doing what he's doing because it doesn't seem to be as significant. God rewards faithfulness to whatever it is that he's called you to do 
no matter what level you are operating in. Does that make sense? So you're going to get the same reward as an usher that Mauricio gets as a pastor if you're doing faithfully what God called you to do. So there are no small jobs in the kingdom of God, right? Can we put up the, the Jenga image? Do you have that for me? Ever play this game? It's a lot of fun, right? It doesn't take too much gray matter. So it's just, you know, you can talk and play at the same time. But the thing of it is, is that you, you create this, this edifice and then uh, you take turns pulling pieces out. And the objective is to pull pieces out without everything coming down. And the one that ends up, I guess, with the most pieces in the end is the winner. But as I was thinking about this game, the Lord started talking to me about how the body of Christ are living stones constructed into an edifice for the habitation of God, right? And I thought to myself, what if we here at the church, we were numbers? And, you know, maybe I'm number 44 and you're number 14, but we all fit together to create a habitation for God, right? But the tendency in the church a lot of times because of the position that we hold or the position that we don't hold and wish we did hold is that there's a lot of disquietedness in the church about what is or isn't happening all the time, right? And I thought to myself, if we would just see the significance of who we are and what we do, even in the small things, we would love our life, right? And we, if we would be faithful in little things, we'd be promoted to bigger things, right? So, you know... In Jenga, your attitude determines your altitude, right? And so the more faithful you are in the little things, uh, the more trusted you'll be with the bigger things. So there's a, there's a proving time for every believer as you come up through the ranks. But imagine 44 down there on the bottom saying, you know, how come 15, 14, and 13 always get to go on the mission trips? And all I ever get to do is down here under the weight of everybody else's business, right? And they're complaining about their stature in the church or in the body. But did you know that if you pull out 44, everything comes down? That you are the support of everything that's happening in Oaxaca right now? Can you see that, that 44 plays a very significant role in the church? That if you remove him, things collapse. I don't know about you, but if I was 44, I'd, I'd feel pretty good about that, right? Right? I make a difference, right? I hold up stuff. Everything that's happening in this church right now that's happening that has freed up people to go on the missions trip, that trip exists because of your faithfulness here in the house of God, right? Because if the pastor can't trust the people that he leaves in place, he's not going to go, right? Right? He's not going to leave the church in the hand of a bunch of knuckleheads, right? <laughs> so, praise God. Makes me feel good that he would trust me to be here while he's there, right? There's something in me that does not want to disappoint. I don't want to let him down. I want him to say, well done. Now, I don't live for the praises of men, understand, at all, right? And I've confronted that in my life many times. Uh, I've walked away from great positions and, and, and uh, attractive offers, because I didn't believe it was God, even though it looked like it would have been a good deal, right? So you have to do everything that you do as unto the Lord, ultimately, right? But at the same time, it feels great to be part of a team. You know, uh, my, my son initially um, wanted to play football. Uh, Y'all know him. He's the guy that plays the acoustic guitar up here, Manuel. Now, if you look at Emmanuel. I'm thinking to myself, dude, you want to die? <laughs> I mean, there's some big boys on those teams there. I mean, are you going to get hit? You're going to know it. I said, remember that what we shared the, the other day on Sunday, everybody's a boxer until they get hit, right? Well, everybody's a football player until they get tackled, right? And I said to myself, I mean, something in me is trying to protect him, so I'm, I'm driving him to the holes of learning. And... Uh, I'm trying to talk him out of it. I said, dude, come on. You know, what if you break your fingers? You can't play guitar. I mean, I, I'm doing all kinds of. <laughs> and uh, 
And I'm saying, and then there's this, and there's this, and there's this, and practice, and getting up, and driving. Because at the time, he was going to Calabasas, and we we lived in Granada Hills. Finally, he screams out at the top of his lungs in the car, don't steal my dream. (laughs) And the Holy Ghost said, yeah, (laughs) leave him alone. And then I realized, okay, you know, okay, you know. So then we got behind his dream, and we got the equipment, and his, 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 his birth dad paid for the equipment, and we got things going, and we take him to practice and everything. And then comes the real games, right? And, uh, I mean, I'm looking at the guys on the field, and I'm looking at him, and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And uh, so they they... Emmanuel is like a, a safety or a, he's a defensive back. And they run a run play around his side. And, I mean, this kid was, my son was fearless. I'm like, you know, you don't run into the front of a Mack truck, right? And this guy's coming. He runs straight at him, and they hit chest to chest. And he just goes right over my son and scores a touchdown. But not because my son was afraid. He put himself in harm's way, and he did everything he could to take this guy out. It was just a matter of mass, of weight, right? So the sun had shifted, and we're coming around to go sit on the other side. We were sitting with the visiting team because they had the shade. And uh, (laughs) then we come around when the sun shifted around, and we happened to be in the end zone. It was me, his dad, some really close friends, youth pastor from the church, all of Emmanuel's, you know, peers. And they decided to go for the two points. And they said, hey, it worked once. Let's do it again. This guy can't handle it. They run around again, and I guess Emmanuel was on to it. And he runs aside, but this time he hits this guy low at the ankles and tangles him up and stops the two points. And everybody on the team jumped in the air and said, way to go, Emmanuel. And I thought to myself, that's the dream right there. The way to go, Emmanuel, from people who are maybe bigger and better than him at this. But when you want something bad enough, right, don't let anybody steal your dream, right? Just because you seem to be underweight and, 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 and incapable by the opinion of other people for that position, go for it if you believe that it's God, right? It it was a David and Goliath story for me, and we were all there, and we all saw it, and he looked up, and we're like, whoa! (laughs) Now, he finished the season with distinction, and then when it came to varsity, he was like, oh, hell no. Because they're like, they're like, you know, 300 pounds. So not only did he have gravel and grit, but he had wisdom, right? So we have to have that same kind of spirit when we're going after our dream. Wow, I really deviated from the text there. Jeez. So the spirit of God wants to animate us, but he wants structure first. You know, there are two camps in the church. There are those that overemphasize structure and underemphasize the move of the Spirit of God. And then there are those that don't even adhere to structure. They invite you to a meeting, and that meeting will go to one in the morning. And you're like, dear God, I got kids, you know. And, uh, you know, and they're twirling and flag waving and everything, which we love. Sunday and I, we go to those meetings. She loves to worship God with flags and stuff. But... You know, an example that I shared uh, in the last service was that I used to be a children's director with my wife. And we had curriculum and we had structure. And in a church, you know, uh, they drop off their kids. You check them in. You put them in. You go through things. Uh, Ariona was on my team at the time. And and then the service ends and then you got to come pick up your kids because life happens, right? So you have to get everything done within a certain amount of time. And there was some people on our team that we were training, and we gave an individual a curriculum and said, we want you to do this segment of the service. And then after you, so-and-so will step up, and they'll do their segment of the service. And so 
I was in the classroom watching, you know, trying to see how everybody was doing and if I could make any adjustments. And I said, so-and-so, you're up. And they went, oh, yeah. And they jumped up there, and they began to sort of admonish and teach and kind of flow in the theme that we were in. Uh, and then they say, okay, well, now we're all uh, going to do musical chairs. And so they set up the chairs, and then uh, they started running around. The kids were having, a fun. They didn't ha uh, having fun. They didn't have a clue, right? Uh, they were just thought this is you know, a great day. And then um, I'm sitting there watching the whole thing. And then she said, I said, okay, your time is up. So-and-so's up. So so-and-so comes over to me, and she's horrified. I said, what's wrong? And she came, I can't, I can't do what I'm supposed to do. I said, why not? So we looked at the curriculum, and she was supposed to give a lesson and underscore the lesson with musical chairs. So what I did is I went to the person that did musical chairs first, and I looked at what she was supposed to do, and she didn't do what she was supposed to do, and so she just winged it. And I said, you did not prepare for what you were supposed to do. And because you did not adhere to the structure, you stole the wind of the person that was supposed to follow you. And then I realized in that moment the value of structure. That when you just do whatever it is that you think that you want to do, it's at the expense of other people and the things that they're called to do. You know, the first time I ever preached, uh, Pastor Mauricio was a staff manager, and he said, dude, you've been given 10 minutes if you value my opinion, take nine. Because if you go 11, you may never preach again. Because the ministry that I was in, I mean, we were talking structure, right? I mean, they were serious about it, but I understood it later, maybe not in the minute. But we'd get guest speakers that would come in, and they would preach like 10 minutes over, and they'd never come back. Because what you do is you put pressure on all of the volunteer children's workers that are watching your children and uh, this guy gets an extra 15 minutes to show off his anointing, right? <laughs> and then you find out next Sunday that five children's teachers pulled out of their volunteer ministry because, look, I've got, I've got a life. I can't, you know, wait 15, 20 minutes watching your kids when we're out of lesson, out of games, and I don't know what to do with them, and they're running around throwing chairs. <laughs> because this guy wanted to go an extra 15 minutes, Right? Structure matters, right? So when we create structure or when we recreate structure to accommodate a larger vision, when we go from 650 to 2000, it demands some restructuring. You understand? And you think, well, you know, I'm kicking against the redesign, the restructure. No, we're not. Everything that's happened at the 650 level has been amazing. The leadership here is like off the chart. I came, I saw what was in place. I'm like, wow, these people are awesome. Their hearts are right. Their skill sets are off the chart, right? But when you build from zero to 650, leadership looks different at 2000, right? Because right now we got leaders that are doing a little bit of everything and doing it well. But when you get to 2000, you can't have leaders doing a little bit of everything. They have to begin to refine what they do and say, I'm the this person, and you're the that person. And, you know, you see the tree, you know, at, at, on the charts and everything, and you need to recognize, you know, in the book of Acts, the apostles for a season did everything. But at some point, there was a murmuring that arose that, the widows were being overlooked because the apostles were not part of the distribution. And so they said, we need to raise up some Stephens, some people full of the Holy Ghost that can do what we did when we used to feed the widows. Because right now we're at a level where we have to give ourselves to the word of God in prayer only, or this whole thing's going to fall apart, right? And so they raise up Stevens, and the Bible says that the delegation of authority pleased everybody, right? And so when you're restructuring for 2000, please be one of the people who sees the wisdom in the restructuring and the delegation of authority and let it please you, right? Because at some point, the level of warfare that's going to be coming against Pastor Mauricio and Pastor Virginia and the leadership of this church because of growth and expansion and taking territory and confronting person, uh, principalities and powers in Mexico is going to require 
that they stay focused on Jesus and on the word of God and that they pray continually to get the word of the Lord for the next move of this church because the Sanballats and the Tobias are going to come up. You know, when you read Ezekiel in the next part, he prophesies again. And God says, I want you to get a stick and I want you to write a name on it and write Judah. And then he said, I want you to get another stick and I want you to write Israel and, and Ephraim and, and these things. And, you know, rods were symbols of authority in Bible days. A shepherd carried a rod and anything that came against the sheep got the rod, right? The staff was for hooking sheep and pulling them away from danger, but the rod was for protection and correction. And it became a symbol later as a, as a, a, a scepter. Kings would carry it because they would say, this is my authority. And so God told Ezekiel in the time of restoration. Remember, he prophesied first in the gathering of the bones, everybody in their place. Then he prophesied again. He said, I want you to write the names of the, of, of, of the tribes on the sticks. And I want you to bring them together and hold them in one hand right because I want the combined force of authority to be in my right hand and so you know if I've got one rod I can give the devil a spanking if I have two rods in my hand I can give the devil a whooping right if I have three rods in my hand I can knock him out right well, these represent people, right? If we will all allow ourselves to come into the hand of God in unity, we will give the devil a whooping, a throttling, right? And he knows that a house divided against itself can't stand, so he's going to get one stick to get offended with the other stick so that they separate. And now we got no power. we got no collective authority. You know, the job of the apostles is to get the churches to work together so they can have apostolic authority to decree a thing and see it established in the church of God, right? And the enemy starts from within the camp, tries to get everybody divided, and, you know, and, it, and it's, it's never big things. It's the little foxes that spoil the vines. What's wrong? He took my seat. And they get an offense, right? And then for the next three weeks, they're racing to get the seat. It's mine. No, it's mine. Right? It's like kids. But the enemy says, oh, I can use that. I can get in there and stir things and whisper in their ears and saying, this guy hates you. He's going to try to undermine you. And the next thing you know, it blows up into a whole counseling thing where you're trying to reconcile people in the church of God because you recognize unity is power and disunity is weak. Right? So I want to work with Pastor Mauricio in Virginia to bring unity to the church. I want to see power released in this house. I want to see the breath of God blow through this house because we've submitted to the restructuring of God. Amen? All right. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.